As you can tell, I love to teach. I love to do research. And it's wonderful to have uh, people who are engaged, who have their syllabuses, who look up texts in the Bible, who ask captivating questions. It is really an inspiration to see that there are people in the church that are still anxious to, to go in depth into Scripture. Uh, in the rest of um, the, in this hour and the rest of the hour, because I don't think that we're going to be able to extend this particular lesson, the seal of the living God, uh, to the totality of this lecture, we are going to deal with the changing of the ordinance in the second part of our class uh, during this session. But let's first of all complete the lesson that we were studying before. The Sabbath as a deeper spiritual experience. In the book, In Heavenly Places, page 237, Ellen White clearly shows that there is an internal and there is an external when it comes to the work of the Holy Spirit. This is how it reads. The quiet, consistent, godly life is a living epistle known and read of all men. Holiness is not shaped from without or put on. It radiates from where? From within. If goodness, purity, meekness, lowliness, and integrity dwell where? In the heart, they will shine forth in the character. And such a character is full of power, not the instrument, but the great worker in whose hand the instrument is used receives the glory. The heart filled with the Savior's love daily receives grace to impart. The life reveals the redeeming power of the truth. So when we're right inside, we will be right outside. Then we have this statement. It's found in volume 10 of manuscript releases, page 252. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, how? <clears throat> Both intellectually and spiritually. So uh, what is the sealing? A settling into the truth intellectually and spiritually so that they cannot be moved just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. So is there an internal settling into the truth that is involved in the sealing. Absolutely, there has to be an internal work with its, which is exhibited by keeping the external sign of the Sabbath. Uh, two more statements from Ellen White on this particular uh, point, that the Sabbath is a sign of a deeper spiritual experience. She states, the Sabbath is a test to this generation. In obeying the fourth commandment, in spirit and truth, that's the internal, right? Men will obey all the precepts of the Decalogue. To fulfill this commandment, one must, now there's a condition to fulfill the commandment, one must what? Love God supremely and exercise love toward all creatures that He has made. And then Review and Herald, May 21, 1895, the seal of the living God will be placed upon those only who bear a likeness to Christ in character. So are you seeing the picture here? Sabbath observance is not sufficient. Sabbath observance is a sign, according to Ellen White, that we have a likeness to Christ, that love dwells in our hearts, that the law of God has been written in our hearts, that an internal work has taken place that, that is exhibited in the Sabbath that we really truly serve the true God. Now, if we keep the Sabbath legalistically, and, uh, and our hearts are not with God, we're not going to give a good testimony to the world, are we? And this brings us to our next section, the Jews of Christ's day. The best way to understand the relationship between the internal work of the Holy Spirit and the external observance of the Sabbath is by comparing how Jesus and the Pharisees kept the Sabbath. The problem of the Pharisees was that they had outward behavior without what? Without the internal work of the Holy Spirit in the heart, and that is called what? Legalism. 
Did the Jews appear mean-spirited in Christ's day? Did they appear arrogant and self-sufficient? And did they have the better-than-thou attitude? So was their Sabbath observance a powerful witness that they were the people of God? Are you kidding? It was a sign of their self-centeredness, and it led the surrounding nations to despise Israel, even though they externally kept the Sabbath. Because they focused on the external without what? Without the internal. In Matthew 23, 25 to 28, Jesus explained the problem that the Pharisees had, and the scribes as well. The scribes were the theologians of the day. He said to them, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. So when you're clean inside, you will be what? You will be clean outside. Verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Do you see what the problem is here? Inside versus outside, outside versus inside. And then in verse 28, Jesus may, uh, expresses the lesson. He says, even so, you outwardly also appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Now it's an interesting uh, case to realize that all of the healings of Jesus on the Sabbath were chronic cases. Imagine a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. Jesus could have waited till sundown. A man born blind from birth. Jesus could have waited, right? A man with a withered hand. That wasn't going to kill him. He could have waited till after the Sabbath. He could have waited till after the Sabbath to do all of his works of healings. But on the Sabbath, he specifically decided that he would make a point of what Sabbath observance is all about. And what was Sabbath observance all about when it came to Jesus? It was showing the love of God for his fellow creatures. Because when I say Jesus was a creature, I'm talking about his incarnation. I'm not talking about what he was before he became incarnate. Notice one example of this Jewish attitude concerning the Sabbath in Mark 3, verses 1 through 7. And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. See, it's, it's a sin to heal someone on Sabbath, but it's okay to accuse. <laughs> That's the legalist. They're always checking to see, is this man going to measure up to our standard of piety? Verse 3, and he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. <laughs> In other words, he said, I want everybody to see this. Step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? Do you know why he said to save life or to kill? Because he knew that they were intending on killing him. So Jesus is saying, let, let me ask you this. Uh, is it better to save? When, when he says save, by the way, the word save in the New Testament means also to heal. It's the word sozo, so it can mean heal. So Jesus is saying, is it, is it okay to heal people on the Sabbath or to kill? Of course, they could read, uh, they could see that Jesus was talking about them. But they kept silent. They had learned by this time that, uh, you know, it was a, a dangerous thing to answer Jesus. <laughs> and when he had looked around at them with anger, this is the only time in the Gospels where we are told that Jesus got angry. 
Not even when he cleansed the temple does it use the word anger. But here, it says Jesus was angry. This is what you call righteous indignation. It is not selfish anger. It is a, it, it is a, a righteous indignation for the hardness of their hearts. And so, in verse 5, And when he had looked around them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, where was their problem? Was their problem internal or external? Internal. He said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out, and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. It's a sin to heal on Sabbath, but it's not a sin to plan to destroy someone on the Sabbath. That's the legalist. Outward observance without the inward work of the Holy Spirit. What should our Sabbath observance be like? Oh, no, we don't do anything on the Sabbath. You know, we practice lay activities. And we're so, you know, we're so legalist. We don't do this, we don't do that. Now, I'm not saying that, that we should be doing these things. What I'm saying is that Jesus was persecuted for what he did on the Sabbath. Have you noticed that? Jesus was persecuted for what he did, not for what he didn't do. Why do you suppose the devil was angry by what Jesus was doing on the Sabbath? Because he was revealing the character of God on the Sabbath. God is a God who restores. God is a God who heals. God is a God who loves you. The devil says, I hate this vision that Jesus is giving of God. And so he leads the religious leaders to accuse him of breaking the Sabbath. Ellen White in Desire of Ages, page 286, you have this in your syllabus, states, the observance of the Sabbath by them was what? Mere its mere observance was a mockery. The Pharisees kept the Sabbath externally, but did not have the work of the Holy Spirit upon their hearts. The one who has the Holy Spirit in the heart will truly keep the Sabbath as Jesus did, because Jesus was sealed with the Holy Spirit and his Sabbath observance revealed it. Now let's notice Ellen White's comments on Jewish Sabbath observance in Christ's day. This is Desire of Ages 283 and 284. These, these paragraphs are filled with truth about what our Sabbath observance should be like. As the Jews departed from God, see that was the problem, right? As the Jews departed from God and failed to make the righteousness of Christ their own by faith, so what happens first? You experience what? Righteousness by faith, right? Like Abraham before he was circumcised. The Sabbath what? Lost its significance. The word significance means what? Meaning. In Spanish we have the word significado. Significado means meaning. And that's a, the, the way Ellen White is using this word. The Sabbath lost its significance or its meaning to them. Satan was seeking to exalt himself and to draw men away from Christ. See what, what I was talking about? And he worked to pervert the Sabbath because it is the sign of the power of Christ. The Jewish leaders accomplished the will of Satan by surrounding God's rest day with burdensome requirements. In the days of Christ, the Sabbath had become so perverted that its observance reflected the character of selfish and arbitrary men rather than the character of the loving Heavenly Father. The rabbis virtually represented God as giving laws which it was impossible for them to obey, for men to obey. They led the people to look upon God as a tyrant and to think that the observance of the Sabbath as He required it made men hard-hearted and cruel. Are you catching the, the image? Is it possible to keep the Sabbath when you're really not keeping the Sabbath? It certainly is. It was the work of Christ to clear away these misconceptions. Although the rabbis followed him with merciless hostility, he did not even appear to conform to their requirements, but went straight forward keeping the Sabbath 
according to the law of God. Now, do you know that the, that, that the greatest controversies of Jesus were over the Sabbath? The conflict, the, most of the conflicts of Jesus were over the Sabbath. What is the conflict going to be at the end? The Sabbath. And you say, well, is there really any connection? Yes, there is. You see, in the days of Christ, the issue was that they kept the Sabbath in the wrong way. At the end of time, it will be the wrong day. Was the Jewish Sabbath the Lord's Sabbath? It was the Sabbath that they had created. The Sabbath of the Jews was not the Sabbath of the Lord. It was a Sabbath that they had created with all of its traditions. It was a counterfeit Sabbath. Is Sunday a counterfeit Sabbath created by man? Yes. So the only difference is that in the days of Christ, it was in the wrong way. At the end of time, it will be the wrong day. But it will still be over what? It will still be over the Sabbath. There's something about the Sabbath that Satan does not like. So what should we do? What should our Sabbath observance be in the light of the time of the end? Should it be like the Sabbath observance of Jesus? Oh, multitudes follow Jesus. They like the way that he kept the Sabbath. Should people love us for the way that we keep the Sabbath? Absolutely. She continues saying, page 284 of Desire of Ages, no other institution which was committed to the Jews, tended so fully to distinguish them from the surrounding nations as did the Sabbath. God designed that its observance should designate them as his worshipers. It was to be a token of their separation from idolatry and their connection with the true God. But now notice this. But in order to keep the Sabbath holy, Men must themselves be holy. Amen. Who makes you holy? holy the Holy Spirit. And then you can keep the Sabbath holy. It has to happen inside first. And then the outside will correspond with the inside. She continues writing, Through faith they must become partakers of the righteousness of Christ. When the command was given to Israel, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, the Lord said also to them, Ye shall be what? Holy unto me. Only thus could the Sabbath distinguish Israel as the worshipers of God. It reminds me of an experience that I had when I was just starting my ministry in Chicago. I pastored the, the West Side Spanish Church in Chicago at the very beginning of my ministry. And one morning, an elder of the church called me and said, Pastor Bohr, there's this family that doesn't have any food. And uh, I'm wondering what we can do about it. And I said, well, you know, um, you know, we haven't gone to the supermarket. Our, our cupboards are empty. I said, but, uh, but let me see what I can do about it. So what I did was I got my wallet, and I went to Kroger grocery store and I did some Sabbath shopping and I filled my cart with all kinds of uh, things that, that would benefit these people and uh, you know when I was coming out of the supermarket I didn't realize that there was a church member passing by <laughs> I didn't know that until the rumor got around in church Pastor Bohr does his grocery shopping on Sabbath. And so everybody knew about it except me. You know, everybody was talking, Pastor Bohr does his grocery shopping on Sabbath. And it got around, and finally a church member meekly comes to me and says, Pastor Bohr, you know, there's this rumor going around that you do your grocery shopping on Sabbath. I said, that's not true. I didn't remember. It wasn't my habit. I don't. I don't do my grocery shopping. I said, I don't know where they got that idea from. And then suddenly it dawned on me. Oh, that's right. I did that shopping on Sabbath to give, take food to these people. And so I told the brother, I said, you know, there was these, th this family that had nothing to eat on Sabbath. So I went to the store. I bought them some food, and I took it to them. And he lowered his head. He was quite embarrassed. He said, oh, pastor, I, di I didn't realize that that's exactly what you did. So I got up in church and I explained what I had done. You know, uh, we can be such Pharisees sometimes. 
I, I would call that sanctified shopping. <laughs> because it's to do good to others. It's not for me. It's not shopping for us. It is to help other people. That's why we allow physicians to serve on Sabbath. Dr. Teske sometimes has to serve on Sabbath. So you say, he's a Sabbath breaker? No. He's a good Sabbath keeper. I know him. But he is helping other people, isn't he? And that's what the Sabbath is all about. Now, let's continue here. From a sign of Christ's righteousness in the life to glorify God, for the Jews it became a sign of their own righteousness to bring glory to them. It made them intolerant, mean-spirited, judgmental, and arrogant. The Sabbath makes no one holy. It is a sign of holiness or sanctification worked out in the heart by the Holy Spirit. Now some enemies of the Sabbath, such as Del Retzlaff, and I'm going to mention his name because he's out there trashing the Adventist church and everything that the Adventist church believes. Uh, he hates every aspect of the Adventist message. He used to be a Seventh-day Adventist Bible teacher in an Adventist school. He says that we don't have to keep the external Sabbath because Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is my rest. That's what he says. But does resting in Jesus exonerate us from the need of observing the external expression of our internal relationship with Christ? No. And I ask this, would these same enemies of the Sabbath affirm that we don't need to be baptized because it's enough to accept Jesus as our Savior in our hearts? Would they say that it is not necessary to partake of the literal bread and grape juice at the Lord's Supper because it's simply enough to understand what this means in our hearts? Would anyone contend that it is unnecessary to have an official marriage ceremony because we love one another in our hearts? They would never say that. But they say, yeah, it's enough to have the relationship with Jesus, rest in the heart, but we don't have to keep the external Sabbath. It doesn't make any sense. Works are, are, are a outward manifestation of faith, and faith is the inward motivation for works. Now let's talk about external Sabbath keepers. Ellen White always kept a proper balance in her view of the Sabbath. She taught that an internal relationship with Jesus will lead to external observance of the Sabbath. She also taught that the external observance of the Sabbath without the internal work of the Holy Spirit in the heart is of no value before God. Notice what she stated in the book Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4, page 95. I was shown that merely observing the Sabbath and praying morning and evening are not positive evidences that we are Christians. These outward forms may all be strictly observed and yet true godliness be lacking. Did she recognize that? She most certainly did. We find also in volume 6 of manuscript releases, pages 396 and 397, an outward observance of the Sabbath will not save the soul. The principles interwoven with every one of the Ten Commandments are to be honored and obeyed in the individual's practical life. The law God requires shall be written where? On the tablets of every soul. That's the internal work. And then finally, three manuscript releases, page 424. All who keep the Sabbath in truth bear the mark of loyalty to God. They are representatives of His kingdom. Their light is to shine forth to others. How? In good works. We are not merely to observe the Sabbath as a legal matter. That means externally. We are to be intelligent in regard to its spiritual bearing. See, there's the internal. Its spiritual bearing upon all the transactions of life. God says, Verily, my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. This is sanctification through the truth. 
Did Ellen White believe in the internal work of the Holy Spirit as a seal? Did she believe that the observance of the Sabbath is the external manifestation of the, of the internal work? She most certainly did. Incidentally, do you know that uh, we had someone ask, uh, mentioned this, that there will be some Sabbath keepers that are going to be lost. Ellen White says that some Sabbath keepers will be lost. What? Well, let's read a couple of statements. Christian Experience and Teaching, page 189. Not all who profess to keep the Sabbath will be sealed. There are many, even among those who teach the truth to others, who will not receive the seal of God in their foreheads. They had the light of the truth. They knew their master's will. They understood every point of our faith, but they had not corresponding works. These who were so familiar with prophecy and the treasures of divine wisdom should have acted their faith. They should have commanded their households after them that by a well-ordered family they might present to the world the influence of the truth upon what? Upon the human heart. She also states in Sons and Daughters of God, page 51, the law of God which is perfect holiness is the only true standard of character. Love is expressed how? In obedience. And perfect love casteth out fear. Those who love God have the seal of God in their foreheads. Can you receive the seal if you don't love God? No. And those who love God have the soul, seal of God in their foreheads and work the works of God. Would that all who profess Christianity knew what it means to love God practically. See, one thing is to profess, and the other thing is what? The practice. She continues, they would have some realization of the infinite holy, holiness of God, knowing that He is high and lifted up, and the train of His glory fills the temple. They would have a powerful influence upon the life and character of those around them, which would work as leaven amid the mass of humanity, transforming others through the power of Jesus Christ. Connected with a source of power, see that's the internal, right? Connected with a source of power, they would never lose their vital influence, but would ever increase in efficiency. Uh, let me just read this one more statement, and then we will uh, go to our conclusion. The quiet, consistent, godly life is a living epistle, known and read by all men. Holiness is not shaped from without or put on. It radiates from where? From within. If goodness, purity, meekness, lowliness, integrity dwell in the heart, they will shine forth in the character. And such a character is full of power. Not the instrument, but the great worker in whose hand the instrument is used receives the glory. The heart filled with the Savior's love daily receives grace to do what? To impart. The life reveals the redeeming power of the truth. Now what am I saying? Am I saying that we should be lax in our Sabbath observance? Absolutely not. What I am saying is that our strict observance of the Sabbath should come from the right motivation. At the end, two distinct days will be external signs of allegiance. The issue will be, are my loyalties with God or are my loyalties for the beast? I'm telling you, I am not willing to die for the Sabbath, but I am willing to die for the Lord of the Sabbath. There is no better sign of obedience in the end time than this. The two opposite days will be the token, the sign, the avowal, or the allegiance to one power or the other. But we will only be willing to die because we have the in inward relationship with Jesus Christ. The Sabbath is an outward sign of inward obedience just like the tree in the garden was an external sign of internal obedience. The final statement, Maranatha, page 164. The image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. What is the image of the beast? It is when the United States combines 
the religious power with the civil power to enforce the false day of worship. So she says that's going to be our big test. She continues writing, this is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. Is the test over Sabbath and Sunday going to take place before the close of probation? Is it before the sealing? Absolutely. She continues writing, all who prove their loyalty to God by observing His law and by refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath, is this a visible thing? All who prove their loyalty to God by observing His law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. So is it clear in your mind what the mark of the beast and the seal of God are? And uh, the seal of God is not only the external observance of the Sabbath, it is the external observance of the Sabbath that comes from a converted heart, a sanctified heart by the Holy Spirit. Now we want to go to our next lesson. We have uh, about uh, 25 minutes left, and so we want to take advantage of the time that we have and study as much as we can. So we're going to go to the lesson that is titled, Changing the Ordinance. And basically it's a study of some aspects that we find in Isaiah chapter 24. Some Old Testament scholars have referred to Isaiah 24 to 27 as the little apocalypse, that is the little book of Revelation of the Old Testament. Because these chapters have many features in common with the book of Revelation. Now I want to read a few verses that we find in Isaiah 24 where it is clear that the second coming of Jesus Christ is being described. Let's begin at verse 17 and we will read through verse 23. This is describing the second coming of Jesus. Fear and the pit are the snare and the snare are upon you O inhabitant of the earth and it shall be to and it shall in it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit and he who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare for the windows from on high are open and the foundations of the earth are shaken the earth is violently broken the earth is split open the earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it and it will fall and not rise again. What is being described there? The second coming of Jesus Christ. And now notice verses 21 to 23. This falls outside the scope of this particular lesson. But, and I have a, an entire presentation on these verses in the series on the 24 elders. The last uh, lecture in the series on the 24 elders deals with Isaiah 24 and verses uh, 21 to 23. And so I'm going to give just a short interpretation. It shall come to pass in that day, that is the day of the second coming of Christ that we just read about, that the Lord will punish on high the host of the exalted ones. Those are Satan and his angels. And on the earth, the kings of the earth. Remember that Revelation chapter 19, the kings of the earth are going to be arrayed against the one who is sitting on the white horse. So there's a heavenly group that's going to be punished, and there's an earthly group that is going to be punished at the second coming of Jesus. Now what is the punishment going to be? It says in verse 22, they will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit. What's going to happen with Satan at the second coming? He is going to be in prison, right? After a thousand years, he's released from his prison. Are his angels also going to be in prison? Are the wicked going to be in the prison of death? Yes, yeah, see, I'm, I'm going over. I, I have verses for all of these things, but I want you to catch the picture. So they will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. That's ter terminology from Revelation 20. 
and it says, and after many days they will be punished. Now wait a minute, how many stages to their punishment? How many stages to their punishment? Did you catch it? Two stages. What is the first stage of their punishment? It says, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of the exalted ones and the kings of the earth on the earth. So that's the first stage of the punishment. Then many days go by and they are what? Punished. Let me ask you, what are the many days? A thousand years. That's right. And then what happens after the thousand years? In Revelation, after the thousand years, you see the holy city, New Jerusalem, and Mount Zion, where the 144,000 are standing. Notice verse 23. Then the moon will be disgraced, and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. Do you see the connection with Revelation? That's the reason why this, uh, these chapters are called the little book of Revelation or the little apocalypse because they have so much in common with what we find in the book of Revelation. So summarizing, a global catastrophe or cataclysm is coming, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ. At the second coming, Satan and his angels and the wicked kings of the earth will be punished by being thrown into prison, into the prison of death in the case of the wicked and Satan and his angels bound to this earth. After many days that are equal to a thousand years, Jesus will return and they will be what? They will be punished. And what will be seen after they're punished? The New Jerusalem and Mount Zion will come into view. The sun and the moon will be ashamed and God will reign in Zion and in Jerusalem. Now, let me ask you, is the Sabbath going to be observed in when God makes a new heavens and a new earth? Yes. Absolutely. But some people say it can't be because the observance of the Sabbath is dependent upon a weekly cycle. Correct? It's dependent on a weekly cycle. And so, you know, uh, the Bible says here in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 23, uh, to use the specific words that are quoted here, it says, the moon will be disgraced and the sun will be ashamed. In other words, there's not going to be any sun and there's not going to be any moon. But that's not what the text says. The text simply says that the moon will be disgraced and the sun will be ashamed. It doesn't say that they will not exist. It says that they will be overshadowed by the glory of God. Now, if you go to Revelation 21, verse 23, very interesting verse, uh, it says that in the city there is no need of sun or moon. Is that the same city that's mentioned in Isaiah? Yeah. It, notice it says in the city. It doesn't say all over the earth. We've got to read carefully. In the city, it doesn't say there is, isn't sun or moon. There is no need of sun or moon because the glory of God is so great that there's no need for sun or moon. I use this illustration. Supposing that it's high noon in Fresno in July. Sun shining, 110 degrees. <laughs> Dry, of course. And so I'm downtown Fresno. And I have a flashlight in my hand, and the beam of the flashlight is on, and I'm walking down the street, shining the beam, beam on the ground. People would think that I am totally insane. Can they see the beam of the flashlight? Is the flashlight shining? Yes. Can they see the beam? No. Why not? Because the glory of the sun is so great that people can't see the beam of the flashlight. That's what we're talking about. What we're talking about is that the glory of God in the city is so great that even though the sun and moon are there, they're disgraced. Are you with me? So will there be sun and moon in the new earth? Folks, let's, let's use our brains. You know, the, the reason I say this is because uh, Pope John Paul II in his, uh, uh, in his pastoral letter, Dies Domini, said that when everything is finished, we will live in an eternal Sunday. Well, that really sounds nice. Everybody says, oh, glory to God, an eternal Sunday, and nobody checks it out. 
My Bible says in Isaiah 66 that we will go from month to month and from Sabbath to Sabbath to worship before the Lord. In order, now listen carefully, this might be something new uh, for you. In how many days do you think God is going to recreate the heavens and the earth? <laughs> you know, I used to think that, that God was going to say, uh, let everything be as it was at creation. Psst! And everything is there. But as I study scripture, I can't reach that conclusion. Because Isaiah 66 says that we are going to observe the Sabbath in honor of the new creation. Which means that you cannot have the Sabbath without having the first six days. Does the second coming of Jesus devastate the earth and return it to the condition it was in before creation week? So is God going to have to perform the work of creation all over again? Yes, he is. And do you know what he's going to do? He's going to do just like he did at the beginning. But there's going to be one difference. And that is at the beginning, Adam and Eve were not there. The first day they weren't there. The second day they were not there. The third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. When God created the animals, they weren't there. And even when God created Eve, he put Adam to sleep. So Adam didn't even see the creation of Eve. How could they be sure that God was the creator? Because he said so. But at the end, it's going to be different because God's people are going to be spectators. <laughs> Can you imagine God saying, let there be light. Ah, whoa. Let there be the firmament. Let the earth, which was everything, was scorched by the plagues. Let the earth produce trees and flowers and shrubs and, and wonderful fruit, Dr. Teske. <laughs> and so, and so the, the earth becomes a beautiful botanical garden. And then God says, let the sun, moon, and stars occupy the places where they're supposed to be. And so now the sun, moon, and stars are rearranged by God in their places when they were moved out of their places by the voice of God. And then God says, let there be in the air birds, and let there be in the waters fish. And then God says, let the earth produce living creatures. Oh, and the earth now on the sixth day is just like it was at the beginning. And then Jesus will say, come my people, let us rest. Let us dedicate this whole day to contemplate what I have made. <laughs> Are you looking forward to that day? That's what the Sabbath is all about. You know, the Christian, the, you know what the problem with the Christian world is? They think that the Sabbath of the Pharisees is the Sabbath of the Lord. Oh, you Adventists, you're Pharisees because you keep the Sabbath. They're thinking of the way that the Pharisees kept the Sabbath. But we need to show them that that's not the Bible Sabbath. The Bible Sabbath is different. It's a day. The Bible says that it is a delight. If you call the Sabbath a delight. Honorable, holy unto the Lord. Are you with me? Our Sabbath observance needs to reveal the joy that we have as Seventh-day Adventists to take a whole day, 24 hours, just to unwind and lay all of our endeavors aside and dedicate the entire day to our relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Quality time once a week. It cannot happen on Sunday. Because the Bible says that we're going to keep the Sabbath. So you tell me, is it logical to say, well, at creation it was the Sabbath. In Exodus 16 it's the Sabbath. The fourth commandment it's the Sabbath. The days of Christ it's the Sabbath. In the days of the apostles it's the Sabbath. In the earth made new it's the Sabbath. But now it's Sunday. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. But the whole world has bought into it. And the whole world is buying into the lies that are told by Francis I and by the Roman Catholic system. And we need to show them the Sabbath, and we need to show them what it truly means and the blessing that comes from observing God's holy Sabbath. Now, let's continue here uh, in our syllabus to the next section. Three reasons why the earth was defiled. The critical question is, why were the wicked punished and why were the righteous saved? 
when this devastating destruction comes? What is the reason why the wicked were destroyed and the righteous were saved? Let's take a look at Isaiah 24 and verses 5 and 6. Isaiah 24 verses 5 and 6. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. See, this is the second coming of Jesus. The haughty people of the earth languish. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants. What is the condition of the earth that leads to this, this destruction? It is defiled or contaminated under its inhabitants. Now, why is it defiled? How did it become defiled? Three reasons are given. Why is it defiled? Why are its inhabitants defiled? Because they, who is they? The inhabitants, right? Because they have transgressed the laws. What else? Change the ordinance. And what's number three? Broken the everlasting covenant. Why is the earth defiled when Jesus comes to destroy it, along with its inhabitants? It's because they have done three things. They have transgressed the laws, they have changed the ordinance, and we're going to talk about that especially, and they have broken the everlasting covenant. That's why the earth was defiled. Now what are the consequences of these three things which defiled the earth? Notice what we find in verse 6. What we read now was verse 5. Let's notice verse 6. The consequences of the earth being defiled for these three reasons. Therefore, what does therefore mean? Because of the other. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth. And those who dwell in it are what? Are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. And few men are left. Now, let me just digress just a little bit here. Whenever Ellen White quotes this, uh, Ellen White quotes this uh, particular verse every single time, she only quotes to where it says, Therefore the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are bur burned. And she stops there. But the verse ends by saying, few men are left. Now the question is, who are the ones that are left? Are there going to be any men left upon the earth alive when Jesus comes? On the earth? No. So who are the ones that are left when Jesus comes? When it says, few men are left, few human beings are left. Who are the ones that are left? The righteous. Are you with me? Because the word left is what? It is a remnant word. Notice Isaiah chapter 4. I'm going to show you this. This is very important. Isaiah chapter 4. You know, this helps us with people who believe in the rapture. Because the people who believe in the rapture, they say, well, the ones that are taken are the saved, and the ones that are left behind are the wicked. But if we can show them that the ones that are left are the righteous and the ones that are taken are the ones that are destroyed, the whole rapture theory is destroyed. Notice Isaiah chapter 4. Let's see who is left. This is not in your syllabus, but you might want to add it. Chapter 4 and verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have what? Escaped. And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem, who, who, he who is what? Left in Jerusalem and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem. So who are the ones that are left? The holy ones or the wicked ones? The holy ones. And where do they live? In Jerusalem. Where are they written? According to Daniel 12 verse 1. They're written in the book of life. So who are the left ones? 
the left ones are the remnant that is, survives the second coming of Jesus Christ that are taken to heaven. Are you with me or not? And I believe Ellen White did not finish the quotation because she didn't want people to be confused about what the word left really means. Because she knew that the destruction of the world, all human beings would be wiped out. But the ones that are left are the righteous. Now let's take a look at these three reasons why the earth is defiled which led ultimately to this curse of devouring the earth and making it desolate and leaving just the remnant alive. First, we find that they transgressed what? They transgressed the laws. Of course, the question is, which laws are being spoken about here? The same word is used in Nehemiah 9, verses 13 and 14, where Mount Sinai the law and the Sabbath are linked. And also we could add Exodus 20 to 24 and verse 12. Now let's notice Exodus, uh, well, rather, uh, let's notice Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 13 through 15. You'll notice I have there Exodus 31 and verse 18, and you can read that at your leisure. But let's go Nehemiah 9, verses 13 through 15. You came down also on Mount Sinai, and spoke with them from heaven, and gave them just what? Ordinances and what? True laws, good statutes, and commandments. Who spoke? Uh, did God speak the ceremonial law from Mount Sinai? No. To whom did he speak the ceremonial law? To Moses. What did he speak to Israel? The Ten Commandments. You can read it. Then it continues saying, You made known to them your what? Your holy Sabbath, and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses your servant. Now some people say, well, those were ceremonial laws that God gave to Moses. It can't be. Let me ask you this. Is God going to destroy people at the second coming because they were not keeping the ceremonial laws? That went over your head. You didn't catch my point. Are God's people required to keep the ceremonial laws anymore? No. So when it says that God is going to bring this desolation because people have transgressed the laws, could that be the ceremonial law? No, because God would not punish people for not keeping the ceremonial law. So these must be moral laws. Did you catch the point? Let's read the paragraph just in case you didn't. The Hebrew word Torah is also used to describe prescriptions of the ceremonial law. So, so some people say, well, those are the ceremonial laws. However, Isaiah 24 verse 5 cannot be referring to the ceremonial law because it was done away uh, with, by Jesus at the cross. God would not punish the world for breaking laws that were no longer binding. So these must be what? Perpetual laws. It is possible that the word Torah should be singular because the Syriac and the Septuagint and the Chalde all have the word Torah in singular. So there are Bible versions that don't say that they transgress the laws. It says they have transgressed the law. And by the way, these are very good versions, the Syriac and the Chalde and the Septuagint or the LXX. Now, does the New Testament support the idea that the laws that were transgressed that led to the destruction deal with the Ten Commandments? The New Testament corroborates and confirms this point. Notice 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits what? Lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. I like the King James translation better. Sin is what? The transgression of the law. By the way, do you want to know what word is used in the Septuagint of Isaiah 24, verse 6, where it says that they have transgressed the laws? It is the identical Greek word in 1 John 3, 4, anomias. 
interesting. The, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The Greek translator used Translators use the same word, transgress the laws, the same word that is in 1 John 3, 4, transgression of the law, anomias. Notice Matthew 24, verse 12. This is the signs of the coming of Jesus. The final generation will be a lawless one, right? The Greek word anomias is one who is a transgressor of the law. Why would God condemn the world for lawlessness if the law was nailed to the cross? Obviously, this is not talking about the ceremonial law. What does Matthew 24, verse 12 say? And because the transgression of the law will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Is that one of the signs of the coming of Jesus that is defiling the earth, the transgression of the law, and the love of many growing cold? By the way, there's no contradiction here. You know, some people put a contradiction between law and love. They say, I go by love, not by the law. They don't know what they're talking about. It's pure foolishness. Because Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus said, in these two commandments, they're summarized in love. So you can say, I love and break the commandments. Come on, be real. That's not biblical at all. Notice what we find then here. And because lawlessness or the transgression of the law will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And then, of course, you have Matthew 7, 23, and this is dealing with the end time. Many are going to claim in the last days, well, we did miracles in your name. We performed signs in your name. We prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We were Christians. And Jesus is going to say, come, you're all mine. No, that's not what he's going to say. Notice Matthew 7, verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice transgression of the law. It's the identical word that is in 1 John 3, verse 4. Is transgression of the law going to be a characteristic of the end time, according to the New Testament? Yes. Now, our time is just about up. So at this point, we're going to pick up at our next class. Um, at the bottom of page 209 on your syllabus with Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8 where this is dealing with Jesus. And we're going to notice that Jesus hated iniquity or transgression of the law. So we'll study this in our next session. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary-level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.